Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Mary Beth. I'm an alcoholic. And um, thank you, James, for sat up here every week for um, all these weeks, and um, I'm grateful for that. And um, I also want to thank all the women that have come for me because I remember when I sat, if you know me, I don't like to like uh, schedule things, like I'm not good with scheduling, and, and so for me to get on the phone and call like a million women to see if they can come on certain dates to do certain things, um, it's just not my gift, and it, the women made it so easy for me because every single woman said yes right away. It was amazing, and only one person had to back out, and um, someone that she sponsored ended up covering for her for two weeks, so it was really amazing. Um, so I'm really grateful, as Dave said, we're, we're surrounded by some really strong women here in recovery, and um, I get to watch it all unfold, and uh, tonight I was just kind of wondering, you know, how many people, isn't tonight the last night for friends on TV or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, we'll probably have, yeah, okay, that's it, we'll, think we'll probably have two people, and um, it, it brought me actually back to a story that, um, why I do what I do, um, there was a girl, um, who actually called me from overseas twice this week, and she has a little addiction going on, and she was calling for help. And um, she had called someone in the program oh, a number of years ago, and she, she's just in Europe for a little while, but she had called them and asked for help one night, and she, she uh, really was detoxing. And the person said to her on the phone, I'm, can you call me back? I'm watching Friends. Hmm. Okay. Yo. I have never done that. Okay. Um, this girl, many years later, is still out there. And um, so I I, uh, I tell that story because I thought Friends was the last night that I saw, so I thought there would be nobody here. But um, yay for our group. Um, but it brought me back to uh, the, the um, right before, well, well, right when I was drinking and I was actually, was, the night I was ripping the phone out of the wall in a hotel room. And um, my sister went and, and talked to a priest and um, said, you know, can you do something? I don't know what to do, you know. My sister's supposed to be taking care of me. And and, um, and uh, she's a mess. And um, that priest, on a Saturday night um, at 6 o'clock, met with me and um, took his time out to sit with me for a very, very long time, maybe an hour, maybe two hours. And I can say to you that when I was sitting there with him, there wasn't one single moment when I didn't think I was the most important person in that room. Now, in retrospect, looking back and having worked with others a lot at all times of day or night or weekends or whatever, when sometimes emergencies come up, um, you know, that priest could have had his mother in town that night, you know, for the first time in a long time. Or his good friend, a priest, could have been, you know, visiting from Ireland or something. But but I never for a second thought that... Um, that he had anything else on his plate, you know, or he maybe was ready to start drinking his wine, you know, who knows. But um, he taught me something about um, about humility and about um, being present and being a channel for God and, um, and I say the God of my understanding for any of you new people. Um, and it was something that I didn't have before because when I was out there drinking, um, I... I would be there for you up until a certain point when I couldn't be there for you anymore. We just never knew what the cutoff was. And um, and some of those cutoff times were times that bring back really bad memories for me, not treating people well. Um, but today I don't do that. And um, anyway, to bring us to the 12th step, um, I'm covering the chapter working with others. And um, there's a paragraph in the uh, 12 and 12. And it is a great motivation for me because I do know that if I go back out drinking, I will I will die somehow. And um, and it says, unless each AA member follows to the best of his ability our suggested 12 steps to recovery, he almost certainly signs his own death warrant. And um, you know, it's been so long since I've had a drink that sometimes it seems almost impossible that I could drink again. And, um, but I had a short period of time in the city, um, late last year when I was away from my home group for a couple months and I was, 
I was in between, I had another group kind of in New York, but I was in between and, I, and, I, and looking back on it, I started to fantasize about the drink. And um, at the time it didn't seem really serious because I was so caught up in a lot of other stuff, but looking back on it, I did start to fantasize the drink. I was back in New York City where I used to live. I remember that's where I, my bottom took 10 years. Um, so um, I do have a healthy respect um, for booze and what it could do for me, and um, I did find out that Bill Wilson was right when he said, practical experience, and this is in the big book, page 89, practical experience shows us, shows that nothing will so much ensure immunity from drinking as intensive work with other alcoholics. It works when other activities fail. This is our 12th suggestion. And then it says, carry this message to other alcoholics. You can help when no one else can. And I had a, I had a practical experience with that. And um, I was in recovery quite a while, and I had gotten some bad news. And um, the news that was like probably one of the deepest things is still a big deal in my life. And um, something not so great happened, and I got some bad news. And um, what I did that night, and it was just from... Um, it was just from my consistency in Alcoholics Anonymous. I have always been consistent for all these years. I have always gone to meetings and I've always met <coughs> with others. And, um, and I thank God for that. But I got this news and I went to a meeting that night and there was a newcomer there and I was there early and I went early because I had nowhere else to go. I just, <coughs> you know, I just was in so much pain. And there was a girl there, and it was the two of us. And I looked at this girl, and she looked at me, and she wasn't happy to see me because she knew that I worked with others, and 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 I knew that she hated AA. And so some, and she did. She hated AA. <laughs> she had to come. And um, so I tried to I tried to help her. I tried to talk to her. And no matter what I said to her, she disagreed. And um, I would come, you know, I just tried to carry the message a little bit. And I was, what I was doing was trying to save my own life so I didn't die. And what happened is I, did, I never did see this girl again, but I stayed sober through something that was inconceivable. And I say to you, Bill Wilson just kept it very, very simple. And he said, I have to go find a drunk and maybe, maybe, just maybe I won't drink tonight. Um, so... As far as working with others, the, the, the most important thing I have to say is I have to remember where I came from and that when I came in here, although on the outside I looked like I had it together, and I can tell you I practiced that, you know, I made sure that, you know, I had it all, I had the earrings on and, I, you know, I, this whole look going on and um, it was the same look actually I had in the bar, but um, um, it didn't work there <laughs> didn't really work there, so I ended up in AA. But uh, I had this um, I had this outside going on, but the inside was I was broken into a million tiny little pieces. And I couldn't put thoughts together. I certainly couldn't read. The 12 and 12, they would give me to read, and I just I couldn't focus to read for a really long time. And so in working with others, it says on page 89, on uh, the same page, it says that we have to remember... Um, can here it is. Remember, they are very ill. Secure their confidence. We can secure their confidence when others fail. And remember, they are very ill. And um, I guess the first place I come from is a place of love and compassion. And that's the way I am. Um, it's not the way I used to be. Um, but I would say that one of the greatest gifts I've gotten that I've, I'm really 99% of the time I can stay consistent with that. And if something happens and I get mad at one of my girls for something, I will usually call her back within 10 minutes to a half an hour. You know? And um, that's always been... I remember the first time I had to do it, it was really hard, but it got easier after that, and then I realized it was much better because I have more time. I'm the one who needs to come to the center. And... Um, because what if what if they don't trust me? What if they don't come back? Um, so anyway, um, I also try not to um, I try not to judge because at least for me the two I had two sponsors in the beginning because I needed both of them, and um, when they weren't 
when they weren't talking to me, they were talking to each other about me. And I insisted on that, and I made it happen, and there was a lot of drama, but I have to tell you, those people never judged me. They never judged me, and that's so amazing to me. Um, Because I felt judged my whole life, and so that's sort of the second thing that I've tried to um, carry to the... uh, to the newcomer, because if they came in feeling the way I did, they certainly didn't need to beat up, be, be beaten up any more than they were, because alcohol had done a number on them already. And, um, you know, I guess I try to impart some kind of a, um, my experience with gaining dignity in recovery, you know. And um, I don't know what it was about me, but my first sponsor said, um, you know, Mary Beth, I want you to go out and get some shoe polish. So I'm thinking shoe polish. She goes, get a different color shoe polish for all your shoes. And um, I was into wearing high heel pumps back then. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was like, it was all about the look. And um, so at any rate, I did go out and I get, and I understood what she was trying to say. She was trying to say, try to take care of yourself. But it was funny because when I lived in New York and I was really, really way back in my addiction, I remember my old therapist, and she was like 85 years old and not a, kind of a fashion plate or anything. And she went, she went for a wedding present and got me an iron. So I'm getting this message, okay, that some people in my life seem to care more about me than I care about myself. So um, I try to pass that along, and I very, very gently nudge the people that I'm working with early on to start, sort of start taking care of themselves a little better. And um, people who come in, and this, isn't, this is just, this is... Um, I, I guess I guess what I want to say is that I listen to where they're coming from first, and I watch them. And um, there's kind of three stages of sponsoring that I do. One is taking them through the steps and through, get get them involved in the fellowship and the service. And there's another stage, which is the mentoring stage, which is kind of a little bit what I'm talking about now, giving them some tools for self-respect in a way. And then the third stage is the peer sponsorship, which is the part where if I'm in really, if I'm in trouble, I have the women that I've worked with to turn to, to be there for me. And I've had that experience um, a number of times in recovery. Um, at any rate, um, what I do is, um, first of all, I try to figure out whether or not this person is really an alcoholic. And that's kind of like one of the jobs that, you know, I have, and um, is to help them see whether or not they're an alcoholic, and I've had that experience, and I've had people struggle with whether they're an alcoholic, and I stay patient because it, it isn't my job to identify them as an alcoholic. They need to come to that conclusion on their own, but for me to work with them, I have to understand that they're an alcoholic, otherwise I just feel like I'm kind of spinning my wheels, so... Um, I also listen because this is my experience. I find out that other people, the people that I work with have other addictions too that have prevented them from being able to get some kind of a spiritual awakening from the steps, like people who have had food addictions are still getting high from the food, so that's come into it. So I, I, I listen carefully to who the people are. Um, I'm not a therapist. I'm not trained, but I do have a, I think, a kind of a sixth alcoholic sense Um that, that I've been given that, that's helped me. Um, I try to find out who she is and who, what her condition is. Um, how far down the scale she's gone. Is she having, you know, is she in the DTs? Is she, you know, there's four, the, the, there's four um, um, characteristic, uh, uh, description, what? Thank you, thank you. Stages, the four stages um, of alcoholism is described in the, um, in the chapter to wives, and I try to see out, see where they fit in, and, um, Sometimes, if there's parts of their drinking that I can't identify with, because I didn't go down as far as they do, I always call my friend Kathy over there, you know. And um, she always calls me back. And she's not the only one, but it's uh, it's amazing. I'm like, hey, I, I didn't do this. I didn't I didn't have the DTs. You didn't have to get me here with a bottle and you know in the car to keep me from. I I didn't go to the hospital. They did not pump my stomach. Um, I just went straight to the psych ward and and. Um, didn't didn't go down that far, but um, so I check out what is her condition because that's important. And the more knowledge that I have about somebody, the better. Um, and something else that you know, I don't know if men get into this, but um, it's been it's been my experience that it's I always look for some form of abuse, 
because um, whether it's psychological abuse or mental or physical or sexual abuse, um, it's important for me to know things like that if I'm going to be working with you because I I tread carefully. Um, and this is really about the mentoring part. This isn't about the steps yet, but it's important for me to know what it is that I'm dealing with. And um, if I'm going to talk to you about God, then I have to be very, very sensitive to who you are and where you come from. And um, it's important to me for me not to um, talk to you about my, you know, little God, the God of my understanding. It's important that I help you um, come to the God of your understanding and um, stay open to that. And I'll give you an experience. There's someone I was working with, and... I had in my head, and I don't know, I might have had 10 years in recovery at this point, but I'm still growing. I swear to God, I'm still growing. And um, I didn't realize that in the back of my head, I had this huge prejudice against um, fortune tellers. And I know that there are psychics, is a better word, I guess. And um, because of my upbringing, because of my closed-mindedness, because of because I had never really thought about it. And, um, and as part of my spiritual journey, this person that I was working with was, I started to notice that she was going to one a lot, and I'm thinking, well, that doesn't seem quite right, because if we're going to live in the day and search for, you know, the will or higher power's will or God's will, um, shouldn't we shouldn't be going to a, a psychic to figure out what the future is. So I'm having this little conflict in my head, and I realized that I was being closed-minded. And so what I did um, was I went with her, and I paid this woman who knows what, and... Um, and it was amazing. The experience for me was absolutely horrible. This woman, she she shouldn't be allowed to practice. Um, but my friend had a good experience with her. But for me, it was really bad. And um, it was actually frightening. But what happened was, after, after going through the spiritual lesson for me of trying to be open, I became more open-minded about it. And it's helping me to sponsor people more because I have sponsored people who's Higher power is, um, you know, the leaves and the, the leaves on the trees and nature, and um, it's not something that I personally can identify with. But but if I'm working with a little drunk who could end up dying of alcoholism, I better be open to just about anything. And um, if you knew me in the old days, you know, I was like a big cynic, you know. Um, so uh, who is she and what is her condition? Um, um, I listen to her, and I also share with her my experience, and to show her that we try to help her to identify with me um, as far as the, tr the strange kind of mental twist that that my mind takes and that my life has taken. And um, there are people in, the, in this room tonight who I kind of knew from my past a little bit. And it's amazing, because when I was out there drinking, I wasn't going to tell them my secrets, because I had an image to keep up. But when they came into the rooms, it was like we were sisters. And I was like, you know, I didn't care if you heard any part of my story. And um, that's amazing. So um, I hope that what I do is I bring the women to the women the ability to, um, to be open and to not have um, a lot of shame so that when it comes their time to working with others, that they'll be able to be generous, have a generous spirit. Um, I want to get to the, um, the, the, uh, one of the three, um, stages, which is, um, the steps and the fellowship and the service work. Um, because I've been talking about the mentorship a lot, and that's funny because I wasn't really going to get to that first. One of the ways that I found it, and, Someone gave this to me, and I'm passing it along, that, um, that, it, that it's the easiest way for me to be able to help you to identify the fatal nature of your disease is to have you sit down um, with the bedevilments on page 52 and go through the um, questions there and try to explain to the early alcoholic that the problem is in their mind and to show them that, there's, that they drank as a result of that. And... Um, you know, that was kind of a hard concept for me because I came in thinking I was insane 
and that I was an alcoholic. And then when I found out that, that the problem was in the mind, it was such a relief because then I could turn to step two and maybe there was a power greater than me that could restore me to sanity. And um, so I have the um, people sit down and go through the bedevilment exercise, which is such a great exercise that it was covered here, I'm sure. But um, for any of you who aren't familiar with it, um, you know, some of the questions are, we were having trouble with our personal relationships. Well, that was me. I had them. I had problems at work. I had problems at, with my um, ex-husband. I had problems with my in-laws. I had problems with my friends. I was, you know, a chameleon. I was, had, I was many different people. I couldn't control my emotional nature. I kicked over motorcycles and things like that. Um, I kicked over my psychiatrist's table. I was the only one who's ever done that. We were prey to misery and depression. And when I wasn't being angry, you know, I, was, I really was miserable and depressed or else when I was high, you know, sometimes I'd be really happy. We couldn't make a living while I had lost my job, so I have that experience to share with newcomers. I'd lost my ability to work in my field altogether. We had a feeling of uselessness. Well, it is the opposite of what I experienced today because, um, you know, I would, I would set out to do good things for people or to become your friend, and it just would always blow up in my face. And people would say I would sabotage it. But really it was, I just didn't, couldn't go any further. You know, I, I would want to go further, but there were so many lies going on in my head and so much manipulation. So at any rate, reading these, ha- having the newcomer go through these sentences and, and, ident- and identify for themselves that the problem really was in their mind and that Booz fixed it, because it says here, was not a basic solution of these bedevilments more important than whether we should see newsreels of lunar flight? Of course it was. Um... But at any rate, they go on with the, you know, there's a couple more sentences there. But um, I think it's one of the most powerful exercises because I see people's faces and they say, wow, no wonder I drank. You know, and I drank to calm down the, the um, terror. And the, um, for me, it was the good morning dreads. And um, so that, I think, rather than have people cut, write a life story, which I usually just sit there and listen to their life story because that's what we do when we meet them. Um, I find out who they are. Um, writing this out, exercise out is, is really, um, it, it cuts through a lot. It, it saves a lot of time, I think. But um, And I take them to the second step, and I show them that um, we can be restored to sanity. And there's something that happens here. Um, for me, when I got sober, I really thought I had a God and this and that. And truthfully, the God that I had, I didn't understand and didn't feel particularly close to. So um, today with the women, I sit down and I say, you know, who is your God? And they'll say, well, I think it's this and I think it's that. And I said, well, why don't you define what you'd like your God to be? And let's see if you can start to reach for that person. And they, I've had this experience twice where they just kind of sat there with a blank piece of paper. And I had them do this with me. Um, while I'm there, and um, they struggle, and why wouldn't they? And so I said, well, why don't you think of this? What would you like in a sponsor? What kind of qualities would you like in a sponsor? And they'd say, well, you know, kind or focused or loving or helpful or whatever. And I said, well, wouldn't you want your higher power to have those qualities? So then they start to get really, it, it, it's true, I really do do this. They get all excited, and they start writing, and they take it home, and they finish it, and that works. And um, they come back and they read it to me and um, the next time, and then I, we take the third step together. And, you know, some people do all of this in an hour. I've done it that way. Some people do all of this over a period of weeks. Some people do it over a period of days. Whatever it is, I go by what, I go by what my gut says to me with that person because every single person that I work with is different. Um, and I'll tell you why I think that when we get to the fourth step. Some people come, and this is amazing to me. I'll never forget the first time it happened because I'm like, I'm an artist, so I'm pretty loose. And so you'll get my four step sheets and they'll be, you know, they just sort of be this pile and it's not such a neat pile and it's not that organized, but it's real and it's true and I've worked really hard on it. And I, I'll never forget the first time I got someone in front of me who showed up with a notebook with um, highlighters <laughs> and tabs and cross-references. And I was like, wow, they really did that. And it's amazing. Like, I want to be them. 
that's what I want to be. And, um, and I think it's easier that way because I was the cliff note person in high school doing it on the bus. That was me. Mm-hmm. So, um, I think that the next four step I do, I'm going to get, I'm going to take some instructions for some friends of mine and get out a notebook and do it that way because it's very cool. So, but at any rate, I do watch the people and how they do their four step and how they handle that. And it tells me a lot about who they are. Like what, you know, why do they have to be so strict or why are they so messy or, you know, it gives me the, the ability in the mentoring part of my sponsorship to help them to overcome some things that maybe need to be overcome. Like maybe I need to be more neat or maybe they need to be more loose or maybe nothing needs to happen. But at any rate, um, it's all about getting free. And um, um, so I take them through their fourth step, obviously, and, um, and their fifth step. But I do it one-on-one. I don't do group fifth steps, and I, I will probably never do them and only because some bad things have happened in group fifth steps that ended up personally affecting me and causing some real serious harms so um, I did try to be open to that um, last December I even said it over a microphone speaking at another commitment that I was more open to it and then some more damage was done with somebody else I knew so you will never see me do group fifth steps because it is just too easy to have some of the things shared that need to be sacred. So um, that's just kind of where I stand, and I'm not. I'm not going to be negative about it. But I was personally affected, and um, it was very upsetting and traumatizing. Um, I want to go on to um, the sixth step, which is um, um, making a list of the people that that we harmed. And someone did this with me, and so it becomes my own personal <laughs> list. And um, I do it in black and white because I, I really can't remember a whole lot of things. I just, for some reason, I, I think I just did mixed a few many of the two, too many concoctions of things. And um, I don't have such a great memory. And uh, so I wrote down on my sixth step the attitudes and behaviors that, that were preventing me to, from being close to God and being able to work, work with others and be there for others. And um, it's my list. It came off my fourth step very clearly. And um, it gave me something in my, in my um, I became entirely ready in my sixth step to have God remove them. And I humbly asked him to remove them in my seventh step. But I asked the women to, to keep the list because I know for me some of those things I really didn't address right away or God didn't take right away. And they did come back to me. And I, I realized that sometimes whenever I'm stuck, I need to go back to that list. And um, what did I fall short on? And I and, and it's, it's kind of always there in red. And um, you know, the eighth step is has been covered here incredibly well by Allison in the ninth step. And um, and I love what she shared about it, and I agree with it. And um, it, it's a, an amazing experience. Um, the one thing I want to add is that when when it's time for someone to make a ninth step amend, um, it's very important. I try to share this, and it's very important that if they go in and make an amends to, to somebody, they really need to wait until in their heart they really do forgive them, and they really do have come to peace with it. And um, I'll share an experience with someone I knew that um, she had to make, it wasn't anyone I sponsored, but she had to make an amends to her abuser, and it was a sex abuse thing. And um, she said, well, how can I do this, you know? It was a family member, and, um, you know, I can't do this. And she prayed for the willingness to be willing to make the amends and to forgive him. Or maybe it was a her. Forgive her, who knows. But um, she prayed, and I think it was for like about a year. And eventually she got to the point where she forgave him, and it was great because she didn't have to go make an amends because what had happened to her was really not so great. So there's a, an experience, and um, as far as 10, 11, and 12, I think um, that getting the people started on the 10-step work has been very, very helpful, that people, um, for newcomers, to be able to have some kind of a checkpoint during their day, like if they feel really afraid that they could stop and write it down and then maybe call somebody or ask God to help with it, or if they've done something like blurt out something nasty to a family member or a friend, um, they can always write it down or call me 
and say, I've done this, and, um, you know, we try to help undo it so that it doesn't get to the point where five days later they're haunted by um, guilt, et cetera, and, which could lead to a drink. So, um, it's amazing to me to see newcomers start to pray. Amazing. It's just amazing. Um, to start to pray to whatever higher power they have, um, where they start to like uh, call me and say, you know, I, I need to pray, but I feel blocked, and I'm like, you're five days sober, you know. And um, but at any rate, they they uh, I do I encourage that, and the meditation comes later, the concentration. But um, at any rate, as far as the newcomer helping others, I always encourage them to stand by the door and welcome a newcomer if they're coming in. And um, I think what that does for them more than anything is give them self-esteem. And if they're helping a newcomer, there's a good chance that they're not going to feel like the lowest drunk on the bus. You know what I mean? And the um, if they're reaching their hand out to the newcomer or picking up ashtrays, we don't do that anymore, but um, doing some kind of a little service commitment, a coffee commitment. So um, as far as the... The, that's the steps, but as far as the fellowship is concerned, I highly encourage them to come on our retreats that we have or um, go to, be, to to feel a part of the, the fellowship. Um, go to um, coffee after meeting and start to create a kind of a fellowship that's going to make them want to go back to the next meeting. Because I know for me, um, I've, I've switched home groups just twice in, in all these years and um, the reason that I come to these meetings I'll be honest with you is to see you guys I mean I've heard all this before you know I've heard it a million times I've heard the steps talked about and read down I've heard speakers I've heard it I've heard it all and um, you guys keep me coming here you know like I knew Beth was going to be here probably I knew Kathy was going to be here etc it's like um the fellowship will keep me in a place where where if I start to get squirrely and if I start, start to fall short, which I have, um, that I will set out to do the steps again myself. And um, I think I'm pretty, I'm pretty honest with the women that I work with about um, uh, where I fall short. And I'm honest with them about that because they need to not have me up on a pedestal because I know that I used to have my sponsors um, up on a pedestal, and if they fell down a little bit, I'd be like, whoa, you know? And I think that's just human nature. And um, I try to show them that I'm just another drunk trying to stay um, sober myself. And uh, I will tell you that um, I do sponsor for me, you know, because working with you helps me. And um, God knows, I hope I make a difference in your life, um, you know, one way or the other, but... Um, anyway, that is the, um, that is really going to the steps in the fellowship. Um, I have seen some amazing things, especially with men. Like, there's a lot of women, you know, how we are, we were all sort of, women sort of band together, you know, and share things, kind of the way we are. But I've seen the most amazing things happen to men in recovery, which is, you know, men who, you know, are sort of taught to, don't share, don't become a part of a group, and this and that, and, um, and men sharing really, really private stuff, and I see men running together and, and doing charity work together, and I see, it, it, it's just, I think that we've got something incredibly special here. Um, anyway, as far as, um, I wanted to read you something here, and it's in italics. And if it's in italics here, Bill meant it to be that way. And it says, tell him exactly what happened to you. Stretch the spiritual feature freely. Um, if he does not, the, if the man be agnostic or atheist, make it emphatic that he does not have to agree with your conception of God. He could choose any conception he likes, provided it makes sense to him. And this is still in italics, this part. The main thing is that he be willing to believe in a power greater than himself, and may he live by spiritual principles. Um, one of the people I spoke to said that, um, she said that in the beginning her God was hope, and hope was what we shared at Alcoholics Anonymous, the 
kind of unspoken love that we we feel when we walk into these rooms. And, um, you know, I have to be very careful with the God thing because um, people need to feel safe because they were dying when they came in here. And they need to they need to be able to come to their conclusion about what their God is, who it is, whether it's, you know, Catholic or Buddhist or or the trees or whatever, and I, I want to stress that. I'm also very, very careful um, not to get, um, let them know early on, and later on I guess I'm, I'm a little freer with it, but like, you know, where I am politically and where I stand as far as, you know, the, all the these issues that are out there in the universe, the, the um, pro-life and pro-choice and, and all of that stuff, I'm very careful not to put my views on them. Um... I had a girl leave my church and go join another church, and it was the second person I had ever sponsored in, in, in early recovery. And I remember feeling very affronted. I'm like, how could she do that? You know, we used to talk about the same God and this and that and the same prayers, and, and now she doesn't even believe the stuff about my religion. And I'm like, and I, and I just, like, I learned a lot from that. Um, that's, that's her right. So... Um, uh, when dealing with, with people who have different things, we, we have to use everyday language and it is better to describe spiritual principles. There is no use arousing any prejudice he may have against certain theological terms and conceptions about which he may have already be confused. Um, I have a family member who still does not, uh, has not been able to identify, you know, with the God that I grew up with. And, um, it was the same God, so. Um, and that's okay. He can do whatever he wants. Um, now, here's something. Never talk down to an alcoholic from any moral or spiritual hilltop. Um, there's a lot of enthusiasm that goes on in Alcoholics Anonymous, especially in this group. started um, many years ago, and um, I've seen so many people get so incredibly enthusiastic about carrying the message that Every once in a while, I'll see them just go a little one way or a little the other way, and and and, and I've probably even done it too. And if I'm on tape doing it, I apologize to you. Um, we get enthusiastic and we become like over uh, zealous. Maybe that's it. And um, but what's the, the amazing thing is is that 99 times out of 100, I've seen these people pull back and take their own inventory and to be able to still carry the same enthusiastic message but um, not be so um, hard driving about it or whatever. And um, I see the program of recovery working so incredibly well, especially in this group. It's amazing to me. And, um, and I have two home groups, and I love them both. Um, anyway, never talk down to an alcoholic from any moral or spiritual hilltop. Um, I don't know what's good for you. But I know what I did, and I know that, you know, if you can use something of what I have, and if God speaks through me, so be it. Um, simply lay out the kit of spiritual tools for his inspection. Um, I love that, for his inspection. Now, it really says, you know, if we do these things, if we take these steps, you know, we'll, we'll be recovered alcoholic. And um, here it says, spiritual tools for his inspection. So that means to me that he can expect them, and if he sees that I'm using them, maybe... Maybe that poor little drunk will see that, that they're so for him to. Show him how they worked with you. Offer him friendship and fellowship. That means to be his friend and be one among many. Tell him that if he wants to get well, you will do anything to help. And that is true. I try to do that. Um, if he is to find God, the desire must come from within. Um, I had... Um, I had... Um, Two family members get into, is it two, I can't remember, it was both or one of them. Um, it was specifically one of them said, when I said to, when I, I went out to make an amends to them and, and I asked them if they wanted to go to an Al-Anon meeting and they actually said yes, if you can imagine. And um, that was certainly an act of God. And, and later on I said, you know, why did you do that? And they said, you had something. Now, they know my life. I mean, you guys know me. You know my life. It's, some days it's good. Some days it's bad. Some days I have money. Some days I don't. Some days I'm, you know, whatever. I mean, I, I try to be pretty consistent, but I have a very human life. And uh, 
But they saw that there was something that I have, and I do have it, and I have had a spiritual awakening as a result of that. Um, so if they're out searching for their God, it must come from within them, but they see that I've found mine. And um, we have no monopoly on God. We merely have an approach that worked with us. We can't keep chasing a man who cannot or will not work with you. I've tried that. It doesn't work. It's silly. Um, we need to be a good Samaritan every day, count, uh, counseling frantic wives and relatives, innumerable trips to police courts. I've done that. I've gone to, I've gone to court with some battered women. I've, I've, um, I've gone to court with people going to um, get a divorce. I've, I've, um, I've spoken in jails. I always encourage that. That's a very good experience. Um, I've walked into hospitals and worked with people in the emergency room, and um, that was very cool. Um, I highly recommend that. Um, here it says, the only condition is that he trusts God and clean house. Burn into, the idea, burn into the consciousness of every man that he can get well regardless of anyone. The only condition is that he trusts in God and clean house. And again, that's the God of his understanding. And clean house means um, go through the steps, make your amends so you can get free, pray, meditate, work with others so you can, you can be free, and, um, and you will get free. Um, let no alcoholic say he cannot recover unless he has his family back. Well, I didn't get everything I wanted in AA, so I don't. I have. I do not promise you. Um, in the beginning, I'm careful about this because I really needed to believe certain things were going to happen to me. I really, really needed to believe it. And luckily, it was years later that I found out that I wasn't going to get everything I wanted. But um, uh, I don't promise you that you're you're gonna you're gonna you not know, not lose your baby or that you're gonna have a house or you're gonna you know have um, not lose a child or a spouse or get married or something. I, I don't promise you those things, but I promise you that um, when you start to listen to the God of your understanding, after you've cleaned house and you feel a clearer channel, you're going to find the peace and happiness inside. And um, be able to um, uh, hear the voice of your of your God. There are some people who come in and it's very difficult for them. And this was really hard for me because I didn't have any friends when I came in. I had nothing left. And this was something that wasn't my experience. So um, when people come in and they have old people places and things, and the old people are like um, seven sets of couples who they've partied with for years, and they can't imagine not partying with them, I'd say with one person it took me two years to get them away from these friends. But it was, I, I can't say get them away. I can say that encourage them that maybe that this wasn't working and, you know, through, through many of our conversations. And little by little, they came to believe that hanging around with people who were high on drugs and drunk all the time is not necessarily something that makes them happy anymore. And they did have to come to their own conclusions through difficult times. Some people have probably slipped. I can't pry people away from their friends. I swear to you, I... I, I tried a little bit on different occasions, and it just doesn't work. It has to come from them. Um, I went into a liquor store once to get um, cigarettes in early recovery because, well, of course, I spoke, you know, and it was there. I was on my way to a meeting with my sponsor. I said, oh, could you stop at the liquor store? I need to get some cigarettes. <laughs> and she let me go in and come back out, and she goes, can you never do that again? <laughs> but I'm a little mocus. You know, I'm a little mocha newly recovering. And um, it didn't occur to me that that was a silly thing. So I recommend to people, you know, try not to go into bars, you know, unless you have a really important reason for being there. And, um, you know, we're not, but later on we're not so afraid of anything or anybody. But, you know, in the beginning, yes, we need to pay attention. Um, also, there was something else that I had. Um, again, I had my sponsor over. I was with my sponsor all the time in reco early recovery. And because uh, I just couldn't be alone, and and it was it was um, Thanksgiving dinner, and I was, um, uncorked the wine because my brother-in-law is French, and I am hosting Thanksgiving. Thank you very much. 
and I'm going to pour him some wine because, you see, I'm a sober woman, and I put on a nice dinner party. Well, my sponsor said to me, once again, don't ever do that again. <laughs> and, it, it, and, and, and the insanity is, I didn't even think of that. Because I, I loved wine. What was going to stop me from smelling the wine, wanting to have a little, little sip of it, you know, or a bottle of it before dinner? And, um, and, and so that, that was something else that I wanted to sort of pass along because, uh, I need to really be there, um, uh, with the girls, uh, just to kind of pass those tidbits along and it kept me sober. And, um, one other thing happened in, in, uh, with her, and I'll share this with you, is that I stood up at a meeting, and this just goes to show you, a year later, I didn't have a clue, and I didn't stand up. I, I shared at a meeting that um, people were talking about marijuana, and I'm like, raised my hand, I'm like, well, you know, I think I have some marijuana at home in my drawer. And I didn't see anything wrong with that. So my sponsor said that she would come over the next day. She should have come over that night. And I said to her, you know, it's no big deal. I really don't know where it is. And um, so she came over and she goes, okay, let's get it. And I'm thinking, boy, this is really dramatic and dumb. So what do I do? I reach right in my drawer. I know exactly where it is. I pull it out. I go to hand it to her and I burst into tears. You know, I was like losing my stuff. And um, again, you know, this is. We do the best we can with newcomers, and that, that's kind of a little philosophy of mine. Anyway, um, to sort of just wrap it up, it says, uh, a spirit of intolerance might repel out. Oh, no, I want to read this whole paragraph. We are careful never to show intolerance or hatred of drinking as an institution. Because remember, it was their best friend. Experience shows that such an attitude is really not helpful to anyone. Every new alcoholic looks for this spirit among us and is immensely relieved when he finds we are not witch burners, which means I have to be more open, more open, more open, more open, and more tolerant. A spirit of intolerance might repel alcoholics whose lives could have been saved had it not been for such stupidity. So for me to be intolerant, they say, is essentially stupid, you know? And... um it is not because it's a moral or immoral thing. It just means that if, you know, if I walk the path that they walked, then I should know that they could die. Um, after all, our problems were of our own making. Bottles, or we should, here it says that we should, um, uh, someday we hope the Alcoholics Anonymous will help the public to a better realization of the gravity of the alcohol problem, but we will be of little use if our attitude is one of bitterness or hostility. Drinkers will not stand for it. <laughs> Funny thing. After all, our problems were of our own making. Bottles were only a symbol. Besides, we have stopped fighting anything, anybody or anything we have to. And um, I learned uh, in recovery that I do have to stop fighting anything or anybody, including I have to get rid of old ideas. And um, I think the hardest thing for me to do is tell the truth to women I sponsor, even though I have to do it all the time, and it's to say... And I try to keep it in the eye so as not to offend them, but I, I do have to tell them the truth and say, you know, you are being judgmental, and, you know, you can't be like that, and you need to be nice to your husband, and you need to do this, and you need to do that. and Because and, um, I am the one person who is sort of given permission to tell them the truth. It's just how I present it that's the important thing. And um, anyway, I, I hope I've... I've uh, brought you a typical experience in working with others and um, that's my personal experience and some people are better at it than me and some people are maybe not as effective but I believe that um, God puts the people in my life who he thinks are going to help me to stay sober today and I am amazed more than you that I have 16 years because alcohol for me was was you know it was the thing that um, I thought made me happy, and then I ended up finding, finding a power greater than myself, and that was the thing. My God, is the thing that, that's filled that, that booze. Instead of booze, I have my God, um, and that's the truth. Thank you.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.